Perfect. Welcome to HVAC Success Secrets Revealed, a show where we interview industry leaders and disruptors, revealing the success secrets to create and unleash the ultimate HVAC business. Now your hosts, Thaddeus and Evan. Hey, welcome back to another HVAC Success Secrets Revealed. We have good conversations with good people, and any good conversation worth having is worth having drunk. Uh, except for this week for our guest, Anthony, who just went off of surgery. And of course, medication can't partake in the alcoholic beverages with us. But either way, glad to have you on, sir. Cheers. Thanks so much for joining us. Happy to be here, boys. Sorry, can't be Cheers. drinking with you. Awesome. Hey, it's all good. <laughs> it's all good. And make it a lot more so, interesting, I promise. So if you do notice a different look to the streaming ad frame today, that is because, uh, and why we are also 12 minutes late, a little bit of technical difficulties uh, on there. So I'll take the blame. Uh, it's all good. Yeah, he <laughs> fucked it up right off the bat when we got on. We're like, hey, this is why we jump on 10 minutes early. And it still took us, you know, an extra time to figure it out. So that's why it looks a little bit differently, but everything is exactly the same. Yeah. You got a bigger logo. It's all good. <laughs> yeah. Right? Make it work. Make shit work. <laughs> Find a solution. Uh, and no stranger to finding solutions is Anthony Pereira. If you don't know him, he is the owner and founder of AirPros USA down in Florida. Uh, he <laughs> he's bought and sold three different businesses prior to getting into HVAC. Uh, so no stranger to being an entrepreneur. Had no technician experience. Yet still chose HVAC. Dove head on in and is now running 16 locations in five, six different states now. Uh, having just acquired another business, which is going to be exciting. Can't announce it all yet, but he's coming to Bama. So roll tide there. That's going to be a lot of fun and really like exciting. Like, uh, <laughs> <laughs> can't quite say that yet. Um, no, it's, I mean, right now, currently at $50 million per year um, between all your locations and and with this acquisition, you're going to be now approaching $100 million just like that. So it's really exciting to have you on. We're really excited to dive into these conversations, and uh, I'm really looking forward to the show. So welcome, Anthony. Well, happy to be here, boys. I appreciate it. And again, I'm, I apologize for not being a little partake in the uh, alcoholic beverages, but uh, hopefully soon. <laughs> yeah. hey, well, once uh, once your deal is all finalized and you get you know passed and in into, uh, let's call it uh, 250 million per year. Once you get to that mark, we'll have you back on the show, and we'll just get shit faced. That's it. Completely hammered. We get blasted together. No problem. Perfect. 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 Well, why don't you give us a little <laughs> background story then and, and how you got into HVAC particularly and, and why HVAC was something that was so appealing to you having just come off, you know, uh, that was a restaurant or real estate at that point? A uh, restaurant at that point. Yeah. Cool. So yeah, yeah, walk us through it. Yeah, for sure. I'll give you the whole background. So, you know, I've been a serial entrepreneur my entire life. Um, I got my start really young in business at 19. I started a magazine called Mud Life. So mud trucks, swamp buggies, ATVs, four wheelers. If it was off road, we covered it. Um, you know, I had no, no, at that point, I had no real magazine experience either. Just had the passion for, you know, things off road. And I started racing mud trucks and, you know, you, you go to a store and pick up a magazine about, a, about, you know, an off road vehicle or whatever it was at the time, all there was was like JP or rock crawler and mud racing wasn't really a really well covered sport. Um, so, you know, in 2000, I think it was 2008, uh, we launched mud life, um, you know, and literally again, with no, no magazine experience, we, we printed magazines without any subscribers uh, or advertising plants and, and, uh, and comically not go to events and kind of hawk them like a hot dog vendor for $3 a pop. And, and, uh, we ended up, um, you know, by our third issue, we were sold about 16,000 stores across the country. So, you know, it was, wow. it was a really cool experience learning how to scale a business. I learned a lot about you know, what, what it takes to put things into production and really from a, from a multi-location perspective, managing different locations, different, you know, distribution channels. And with that business, we, we really grew up a brand, right? And that's kind of my secret to success through building companies my entire life has been building the brand. And so with Mud Life, we built the, you know, the merchandise line, the event business, and we had a, a huge rig that would tour around the country and we show up and, and host big events and, and, you know, through, you know, Okeechobee Mud Fest in Florida and, and really kind of grew the brand business um, of, of Mud Life and in the event business and wound up selling that company uh, in 2000, I think it was 11 or 12, 11 or 10. Um, I was like 22 years old and, uh, you know, stayed on for a while 
and worked with the uh, the team that acquired the business as an executive publisher. Um, eventually wind up leaving that and either being young or dumb or stupid and dumb, whatever it was. I thought it'd be cool to own a sports bar, right? Or like a nightclub at 22 years old, especially in my sense. hometown. Yeah. It makes who perfect sense for being 22. <laughs> who would, who would want to own a, be the, be the cool kid on the block and own a sports bar, right? Or a nightclub. And so I did, I did just that. I bought a failing uh, sports bar uh, in South Florida with the intent of making into a country Western themed restaurant and nightclub concept. And, you know, end up, uh, rebranding the business, we do a full build out, didn't know the first thing about restaurants or nightclubs, didn't know about inventory controls, didn't know about managing employees. I mean, at Mud Life, we had 15 or 20 employees, you know, with, with, with the bar, we had over a hundred at one point and um, quickly became, again, built the brand, right? Built the Cowboys Saloon kind of brand. And that brand uh, ended up uh, becoming number one nightclub in South Florida for three years in a row. Um, sold the company a couple of years later, just that one location, kept the naming rights to that business and figured I'd be done with nightclubs. Cause that's a tough life, right? I mean, you're up till four in the morning, five in the morning, you know, you're cashing out 20 bartenders. We're doing three or 4,000 people on a ladies night. I mean, it's just jamming. It's, it's, it's a lot of different nuances in that business. And I think have helped me and other businesses because you can manage different levels of the organization all at one time. Um, and, and so we ended up, uh, I, I did real estate for a while, did some, you know, thought I was Mr. Flip it and was flipping houses all over the place, you know, whatever that one TV show was back in circa 2000, you know, 13, 14, where fix or flop, whatever it was, right? Yeah. Uh, dabbled there for a while, had a good time and um, somehow got drugged back into the bar restaurant space. And this time we, we built a, a locational uh, chain, a chain into uh, six locations in, in three states and then end up selling that to a, to a private family office equity kind of play. Um, and, you know, growing up as a kid, my, my dad was on and off again uh, and, and being an HVAC sales technician. So he'd, he'd be the he'd be the sales driver. He'd be the sales tech. Wouldn't actually fix anything. Just really good at selling. And I, I jokingly tell him now I love him to death, but he's like the king of the $5,000 sale, right? Like he'd walk out no matter what it is, it's going to be five grand. It's like, it could be a 20-seer system and it's five grand. And uh, and so when, <laughs> when, when, I, when I sold the, the country western concept, you know, my father was my construction manager. So he'd, he would fly out to all the locations, do the build outs, you know, manage the contractors, ensure they were getting built. Um, and he goes, hey, let's open an AC company. And I said, well, you know, I don't know the first thing about AC, but I, I, can, I can help, you know, branding and marketing. And, and, you know, I really want to get something for my father to do. Like, you know, because I was, he was working for me at the time and I want to give him, you know, kind of uh, his own thing to run and manage. And, and in uh, 2017, we launched AirPros. Um, and, you know, we... <laughs> I had this crazy idea because I kept seeing all these trucks driving around town and, and I'll tell you a story later about Dan Antonelli and I, and I love him at that. The guy's a great guy. And, and, but we had a soiree trying. So take a note about that and bring it up later. Cause we had a soiree about trying to rebrand the air pros tiger trucks. And that's pretty, <laughs> cool. but, but uh, we started wrapping these vehicles uh, with, um, with, uh, you know, random, random uh, wild animals. Like it was, I had zebras and, Cheetahs and, <laughs> and all kinds of crazy shit had nothing to do with air conditioning. I promise you. But when that fucking thing drove by, it caught your attention, right? Like, oh my god, this thing is cool looking. What are these guys? And it was an AC company. And so we, we started with one truck, and you know, we we practiced again, jokingly we call it the turnover model. My father would be in the truck as a sales guy with the technician, so a tech would go in and diagnose and come back out and tell my dad what he what it was wrong, and he'd go back in and sell it. And so really, <laughs> for, the first, for the first like I don't know three or four months. I was, I had no idea what I was doing and I, I learned as I went, but th that's how we started Air Pros. And, and today we have a fleet of almost 400 trucks and, you know, close to five or 600 employees now across the country. So, but, you know, back to the Dan Antonelli piece, and it, it's kind of comical because, you know, it's, uh, he, he's probably one of the most brilliant branding experts when it comes to vehicle wraps and vehicle designs that, that exists. The guy's fantastic. I've used him for other brands we've done now, but we had this, we had this soiree about, uh, about uh, he, we, we hired him to do a rebrand for Air Pros, and I just couldn't give up the Tiger Stripes. And, and again, it's not like it's not, a, it's not a special Tiger Stripe, it's just a random Tiger Stripe. And, and he just, we, we, I, couldn't, I couldn't commit myself to doing it. He got so mad at me. He goes, You're the only client who's never taken one of my brands. And I said, Damn, I'll do something else in the future. But uh, it's pretty comical. But uh, great guy, I love him to death. He's an absolute rock star and, and uh, has done well for other brands that we've done. But um, yeah, we started. So in 2017, we started with one location uh, in Davie, uh, you know, just really focused on driving online, you know, uh, marketing prowess through Google, Google ads, PPC ads, you know, wasn't afraid to spend the money. Like we just kind of went balls to the wall and, and, and spent a bunch of money, you know, when it came to marketing and, and we performed well and the company grew and grew naturally and organically. And, and, you know, over the course of the next couple of years, we, we got really involved in, 
in acquisitions and we've used acquisitions to really kind of fuel our growth. Um, it's, you know, 2017, we made our first acquisition uh, in 2000 and I believe it was 19. So from 2017 to 2018, we grew two more organic locations in, o in Ocala and Orlando. And Ocala is not really a city people would think to go to open an AC company. Like there's not really a whole bunch going on in Ocala. I mean, granted, I, I spent a lot of my youth in Ocala, so I knew it, knew the market. But uh, we opened Ocala Branch Greenfield in 2018. Uh, have a great leadership team there. You know, absolutely rock star managers. Um, and those same those same people are here today and, and, gr and growing with us. And then we opened Orlando because it was the obvious next step for us. And then we did an acquisition in uh, in Dallas Fort Worth. Um, small small business there. Um, did a bunch of other acquisitions. You know, one of the, one of the best acquisitions I ever did. And I probably won't say the name on 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 the show, but it was a uh, a company that was going out of business, and I happened to acquire just the phone numbers. Um, so it was mm. a phone number acquisition, and lo and behold, you know, we were at the time maybe a ten truck operation, and and we bought this the phone numbers of this company that was out, was going bankrupt, and they wanted to close down the business, and they 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 were a 30, 40 year old company, and. I can tell you, we couldn't handle the volume those calls came. Like the, the, they were just coming and it was nonstop. To this day, the phone still rings to that company and we still service customers and, and do really great by it. So we've been really strategic uh, from an acquisition perspective and not just buying you know companies, but buying assets, buying customer lists, so on and so forth to help really grow and, and fuel our growth. And and um, I think as you mentioned earlier, you know, our first, I mean, not our first, our, our, our entry point uh, and our most recent transaction was in the Alabama space and that'll be announced soon. And, and you know, we recently just uh, closed on a major facility, um, one of the first platforms uh, to to raise a debt facility versus going and doing an equity play. Um, so we kind of control our own destiny. It allows us, you know, the, the freedom to to do deals that we want to do. And and you know, as as being the CEO of the organization, we're looking forward to a really really strong uh, finish in in 2021 and start in 2022 with a bunch of acquisitions. So that's kind of the air pros, how it came to fruition in a nutshell story. A little little long winded, but. Hope it gives you that background. No, there there is a lot to unpack too. Um, That's our entire show is just unpacking that story. So. Yeah, I've got I've got like six different things written down to unpack that story, along with the research that we did ahead of time. But you know, one thing that, and I'll touch on this because it's an easy segue into something else. You know, I, I saw a quote from Richard Branson uh, the other day: If somebody asks you to do something and you don't know how to do it, just say yes and figure that shit out later. I don't think he said shit in his quote. That's just me adding that in there. But when, but when I hear, context. you know, right, it's, it's a good context, right? I mean, like, I, it, you know, but the, the whole idea of that is, you know, when you start an air pros, you're like, fuck it, I don't know how to do an air conditioning company, let's figure it out, right? And now here you are, you know, not even five years later, four years later, approaching in on the We had our four year anniversary uh, last July or June, June was our four years. Right. So, so there you go, right? Like just over four years and, and now you're a hundred million dollar per year company. You just figured your shit out, right? I think a lot of people can take that is don't, don't wait um, to do something because that's, if you just wait, your ideas are just going to go by the wayside. You have to jump into action and just figure it out. So I love I that, that part conversation, of it. So, you know, a lot with people that I, that I interact with, they're always like, well, what was your secret to, to success? And mine is always just don't be afraid to take a damn risk. Like, like jump in mm -hmm. first and figure it out. Most people and, and a lot of people I, I talk to are normally risk adverse, right? Oh, I can't afford it. What if I screw up? What if I, what if I fail? What if I, you know, burn all the money and I, and I go out of business? Well, listen, you're never going to know until you try. So take the risk, jump in with two feet, figure it out. You're going to sink or swim. If you sink, learn to swim pretty quick, right? Like, yep. <laughs> figure it out and, uh, and come on shows like this and ask questions yep. and, and, you know, ask industry experts and network and learn what you can. Well, and that's the idea. Like most people are trying to win a game three, nothing, you know, I'm going to take three shots. Yeah. I'm going to make three and I'm going to score three times. You know, you're trying to play the game of I'm, I'm going to win 127 to 116, right? You just want to win a little bit more than you lose, but it's infinitely and exponentially greater results because you took more shots. Well, as well, Wayne Gretzky also, says, you miss hundred percent of the shots you don't take. 100%. Yeah. And, 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 and to your point, listen, the Air Pro story isn't all dandelions and roses, right? We've had our bumps and bruises. We've had our hiccups. We, we, we've tried big box. We, we initially were a commercial business that we realized we couldn't do commercial, right? I mean, we, we've tried it all. And, 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 so, and, and you, and listen, we, we had good clients. We did well by them. We still serviced people on, but that wasn't our skill set, right? Our, we, we were good at right. generating leads. That was what we really thrived at. I mean, right now we're running six, 7,000 calls a month, you know, as a platform. It's a lot of calls, a lot of customers you're touching, right? So, you know, it, it's, it's just, 
you figure yourself out and figure out what works and what, what works for you and what you enjoy doing and, and take that and scale with it. And I think that's what made, you know, AirPro so successful to date is that and our ability to, as a company, as a team, you know, we have a great team here at the company, great organizational team from right down from the local level to the call centers, to our executive team that really get that and really, you know, push forward and push hard and, and drive the bus every day. And that's what it takes, you know, it takes consistent, totally. consistent, consistent growth, consistent, you know, performance, consistent effort. Um, and, 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 and air pros is one of those success stories. hundred percent. Well, so many guys try to go so wide with their net thinking, well, if I add more services, I'm going to get bigger results. But the, the reality is if you can go really narrow and deep and become the best in the market at that one thing, you're going to stand out far more. And there's, there's companies we've acquired over the past, or we've actually wind up killing some certain trees. We, 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 we've ended yeah. plumbing or electrical because that wasn't our skill set. We didn't know any, we didn't know enough, you know, like we didn't, we didn't know enough to actually get the job done. And we've learned over the years, right? So, you know, yeah. outside of the acquisitions, we're, we're strictly HVAC when we obviously, we, we add, we've added trades through acquisition now, but we, we've never once kind of stepped outside of that HVAC, you know, kind of core. Right. That's the core of our business today. Totally. Mm. Love it. Um, you mentioned the idea of brand versus building a business and it, and that was the common denominator amongst all the businesses that you've successfully grown is this ability to build a solid brand. Um, walk us through a little bit of your, your thought process around what the difference between the two is, why it's easier to build a brand versus easier to build a business. And then what are some, some key things that guys need to consider when they are looking at a rebrand or starting their business? Yeah. So one thing I tell, and I'll take this question in two parts, right? The first thing is, is that from a acquisition perspective, I've never wanted to rush a change of name or a brand, right? If it's got brand mm. recognition and market and brand value, why screw with that? You know, build upon that. Um, one, of our, one of our biggest secrets to, to branding in a market has really been our PR push. You know, it's probably the most underutilized piece of, of, of brand building is PR. And that's through right. releases, through community involvement, right? Endear yourself to that community, endear yourself to your to your client base in the area you operate in, and that really can can yield bigger results and blowing a bunch of money on on PPC or on on social or whatever you're doing billboards, right? Because a lot of guys will come in in a market and they'll throw up a hundred billboards, right? Which is good if you have a brand, right? But if you don't have a yep. brand, right? The I think I heard a story one time from Ishmael. I think it was Gary V at an event and, and, you know, and Ishmael goes, I'll put a hundred billboards up and Gary V says, well, no, go, go do that. And I'll go ahead and bid on your, 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 your name on your billboard as a competitive advertiser and you get a, you know, $2 per click lead. You know what I mean? So again, you, you have to really build that brand first and, 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 and focus on that. And it's just, you know, a lot of guys come in the markets, new guys, and they'll spend $20,000 on billboards. Well, nobody knows who ABC air conditioning is yet. Build some yep. brand base first, then spend the dollars. Initially, when we launched in any market we go to, we really kind of focus on direct consumer response marketing or DCRM, I call it. Get the phone to ring, know what your costs are, know what your return on ad, ad spend is, focus on that, right? Hammer that, fine tune that, and then continue to expand it. But the most unadvised piece of, of branding ever, and I've done it through the magazine business, through the restaurant business, through everything we've done, events, is that PR piece. It's super, super important. And, and it gets the most touches that I think bang for your buck possible. So you mentioned billboards. Um, oh, I can't see this. Hang on. Uh, yeah. Walk me through <laughs> this billboard here that I found. And if anybody's listening later, it's a guy and he's leaned back with his hands behind his head. And the slogan is, we'll make it blow harder. And it has air pros on there. Uh, so walk us, yeah, no, walk no, no. us through that. <laughs> Again, you know, that's, I think that billboard went up in 2018. And I, I didn't know what I didn't know. I, I wanted, there's this competitor in the market that uses a slogan, your wife is hot everywhere. And, and, and it really drove, drove me crazy because here I am a, you know, five or six truck operation. And how do I, how do I make noise in a market where it's saturated by your wife is hot and some erotic chick pulling her hair on a billboard, right? Like, okay, great. <laughs> I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pull something funnier than that. And I actually have a couple other ones. And we had one that, you know, it was, a, it was a female with a duck machine saying, we're going to suck your ducks and all, all, all kinds of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> they, they didn't approve that one. That one got denied. Uh, the one I had was pretty funny. It was, uh, a couple in bed and, and the woman looking over at the, at the man and saying, is your unit underperforming? Call air pros. And it was, you know, that AC unit. And it, again, it, it was, it was, it was just a, a branding piece, right? It caught the attention. No one yeah. was going to call that billboard because it said air pros on. They're going to remember that slogan or that, or that funny comical, comical piece. And, and it caught, it caught the attention of the public. And as you can right. see it, uh, 
we, and we, we parked it at the most obvious intersection up in Pompano where like it was so much traffic and we, we, we got, we got hate calls for it too. That is such a oh, yeah. sexist piece. Why are you putting that up? I'm never going to call you guys. You guys are a joke, but we also got, listen, they're talking about us. Right. So it, uh, it, it, it did its job. I think the majority of people would probably laugh at that billboard and that's, 100%. you know, that's, that's, that's a brand. I, I, I stumbled upon that when I was doing some research and I was like, fuck, I got to build this into this show somehow. Uh, <laughs> I think that is absolutely a genius ploy. Uh, <laughs> now, don't, now what we're going to see is there's going to be a, like this, this, this wide phenomena across the nation of people putting up billboards and saying, we'll make it blow harder. <laughs> <laughs> I should trademark that now. Right. And I'll start, I'll start right? issuing uh, royalties on it. hundred <laughs> um, percent. One other thing I wrote down, which I thought was genius. And, and it's funny, I'm pretty sure Ken Goodrich mentions this in his, uh, his book he did with, um, Michael Gerber, when he redid the e-myth for, for HVAC contractors and acquiring phone numbers. That's brilliant. Like it's yeah. such a cheap play compared to combine, um, acquiring a business and just buy up the phone numbers of bankrupt business. And hell, if you get 10 phone calls a month, it's going to pay for itself pretty damn quick. 100%. And you know, the way we did this acquisition, we bought these phone numbers for the big one we bought. And I bought, I've done a couple of them that way now is, uh, you know, it, it, we're having an absolute auction. And I thought I'd show up. And again, this is circa 2018 going into 19, right? And I walked up there and, and you know, there's probably, I don't know, three, four hundred people bidding on random shit, you know, duck cleaning machines and fan. And this, this company had a, had a plethora of random stuff. Like I'm talking right. about, they probably had 500 UV lights on stock, you know, 300 fan motors, you know, 875. I mean, it's just random, random things. Right. And I see a guy sulking in the corner, uh, a little upset about what's going on. I think it seemed like, and I walked up to him and asked him and he happened to be the CFO at the time. I actually brought in to wind the company down and I said, Hey, you know, we got to talking and became friends with them. And, and I asked them, you know, what are you doing with the phone numbers? Well, I don't know. You want to buy them? And just that one conversation and, 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 and that led to us buying the numbers and that, that still yield results today. And, and it's been, again, it's super powerful. It's a super effective and, and efficient way to, to get customers. I'm going to spend a whole bunch of money. Totally. Well, especially the, you think about that, the advent of like cell phones, right? So now what people do is they're going to save the phone number in there. Uh, and so if they save it, uh, then they just, they just look it up and they call it. Right. But the part that, that, that blows my mind is that you still get calls to this day from business that went out of business and it's like, okay, well, why did they go to business and why, you know, are you having that success? You know, obviously the foundations and the pillars that you put in place in business are super important. So coming from, you know, I, I, so we were chatting kind of before, you know, about, all right, well, when you bring on, um, I not even bring on, I guess when someone new gets into the business or they come from the tech background, so they've been a service tech, they want to start their own business. Now they go out and they're like, oh shit, it's a little bit harder than I thought it was going to be. What are some of those pillars that you found to be absolutely critical to your guys' success that every business should put in place, but not a lot don't? Not a lot do, sorry. You know, it's, uh, you, you probably hear this regurgitate a lot on, on a lot of these, all these webinar, webinars, uh, podcasts, but it's, you know, we, we do a really, really good job of using technology to manage our KPIs. And we've built some pretty efficient KPI management tool tools to help us, you know, on real time, see what's going on in business from our NPS scores to have what our closing rates are. I mean, stuff you normally wouldn't have inside of like a service site or house call pro we've kind of taken a step beyond that. And, and I think that's really what's helped us be successful is our visibility to the business. Um, you know, but a lot of times you get a technician who's in the field and, and, you know, they're running calls all day long and say, Hey, I want to go start a business. This is my goal to open my own shop. Great. It's a great goal to have. And, and I wish all the best of luck, but a lot of times don't know what they don't know. Right. They don't know how to manage payroll. They don't know what to pay their technicians or their staff. They don't understand how to market. You know, they're afraid to spend the marketing dollars. What if I put the money out, I don't get it back in. These are risks that you got to have a risk tolerance to actually, you know, partake in. Otherwise, you're never going to be successful, right? And so, you know, I, I tell people all the time, well, how, how, how do I start a company, they ask. And I said, well, you know, get in there, figure it out, right? Un figure out what you need to be successful. Figure out how to manage your payroll, what software system you're going to use, how to manage your customer interaction, what's your customer journey, right? What is that journey? If you're going to build a company, what's the org chart? How do you manage and build that? How do you maintain that? What's your HR process? How are you managing assets? What's your inventory process? A lot of minutia and these little things that add up to a lot of a bigger thing, right? And even a company at our size, or we have you know those seven hundred 
devices and circulation from tablets. And that bill alone is twenty five, thirty thousand dollars a month, right? And and so managing those at this level of of of, of, uh, of organization is super important, and having the right systems to do that. So it's all about system and systems and processes, and and getting them established, and knowing what system and process to establish. Hmm. Wow. Yo. <laughs> well, and so, that's the thing is. is if, if, they, they're taking on a whole nother job. And even within that job as a business owner, there's two jobs there because you're working in your business, right? With all of those things. Plus you're working on your business and what is the next steps? How are we going to grow? Who, who's our next key hire? And all these other things that you need to be thinking about. Plus you're the tech, like that's three jobs in one, right? And and most guys don't look at it that way. And to your point, until they can remove themselves from working in the business to working on the business, you're never going to scale it. And that's an old adage, you know, yeah. I'm not, that's not some gold nugget I'm giving you. That's a gold nugget that's been around forever, right? Like oh. you got you got to get to a point where you can get out of working in the business and work on the business, and and that takes time. You know, time yeah. is, is is the number one cure to that to that ailment. Totally. Well, I love the old adage too of you know, as a business owner, most people get into business to work half days, and uh, people think of <laughs> yeah. that as oh, well, I'm only going to work four hours, but really it's half of twenty four. That's what you're working at a minimum as a business Man, owner. Minimum. You need, as a minimum, uh, if you're not putting in that, you're you're not going to succeed. That's for damn sure. Exactly um, right. Sweet. All right. Random question. Random question generator. All right. Let's do it. So th this is a part of the show where we bring out a random question. We pull it off the internet, and uh, it has nothing to do with anything that we've been talking about or anything to do with HVAC. Okay. I love it. All right. <laughs> so what is romanticized in modern culture but shouldn't be? Social media followers. Mm. Mm. <laughs> That's a good answer. That. I don't know if it's a good answer. I mean, it's. I, uh, it. I mean, people. People are. I mean, I. I guess you're, you're rated nowadays. How many followers you have on Instagram or Facebook? Like, it's absolutely mind-boggling to me. And, and we, we become a culture. You know, I don't want to get you know vulgar on here, but you know, we become a, a culture of a bunch of softies who care more about their Instagram likes and social media likes, and actually care about interaction with with human people in real life. And, and, you know, it's, I, I, I think that that's been kind of, I guess, romanticized the word you use. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think we need to get back to, you know, human interaction, right? Like mm -hmm. I'm all about, you know, using zoom for, for team meetings and so on and so forth, but it's only so much you can accomplish virtually in a team meeting that you, that you could accomplish, you know, in person, that it's one-on-one -on -one interaction uh, and that communication element that, 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 that's been taken away because of all this, you know, social media, um, you know, it's, it's, I think it's over romanticized. That's, a, that's the right word to use, I think. That is, yeah. uh, that is such a great answer. Cause you think about that, like, well, and, and you see it, uh, I mean, we're, we're all a product of, of roughly the same generation, uh, you 100%. know, given, given our ages and we're like the start of the millennials and don't, and really hold us against uh, that against us. Um, but you, but you think about like the, the latter end of the generation and even whatever generation is after that, you know, when they, they get depressed, if they only get like two likes on a post that they made, right. Yeah. But well, who gives a shit? Like, it's like right exactly now on the, right. like, seriously, like right now on the show there, you know, we have four people watching live at this present moment in time. Do you think yeah. I give a shit about that? No, because you know what I know is I know that there's going to be over 2000 people that watch the show on a week over week basis and not everybody comments and not everybody likes, but they consume that information. As long as you put that out there and just get over yourself about a like and comment and a share, who cares? Yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, listen, well, I mean, we're all guilty of it, right? We, no, we, we, no, we, we become, 100%. You, me, I mean, I'm 34, yeah. right? So I was kind of in that, in that cusp when, you know, my space was popping and then, you know, my space faded away and you got Facebook and Instagram and others like, uh, there's there's Twitter and 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 OnlyFans and all these other random platforms, TikTok. <laughs> I'm guilty of sitting there, at, you know, at eleven o'clock at night, scrolling on my newsfeed to watch random shit. You know, I thought you were gonna say scrolling on OnlyFans. But but you know, it's 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 uh you know we're all guilty of it, right? But it's yeah. it's it's so over it's so over romanticized that that that's how that, that's what's accepted now, like that. Having mm -hmm. that ability to say, I have a million followers on Instagram. Cool. Good for you. If you can monetize right. it even better. Right. Right. Uh, you know, my Instagram's on private. So, <laughs> you know, it goes to tell you what I think about that. Right. <laughs> well, and it, it, I mean, as a business owner, it's easy to separate those two things because yeah. 
your goal as a business is completely different in what you're posting for, right? I'm posting and that itself is the win. Just the fact that it's out there, it's done and I've won and whatever happens now, cool. Um, Versus as an individual, like there's the societal aspect of of where do I rank, where do I sit? And yeah, I tried to lecture a lot of my nieces and nephews on that shit and they just... It goes straight over their head, and it's. it's fucking but then when they see that, like you know, I'll be transparent on you know, and for us, and like it's you know, again for the business, it's easy when you have the business page. But you for look sure. at like Evan, like my profile, for example. You go to my my Facebook profile; it's all business shit. Post yeah. after post after post after post after post, and I'm constantly trying to get stuff out there. But that to me is not a personal thing. I've essentially sure. used my profile as a business as aspect, a business. and so 100%. being able to switch that. And have that connotation is in, is especially important, especially powerful for people to understand that when they see like your nieces and nephew, Evan, like when you're out there, like, no, this is like, I've taken my, my name, I'm representing my business. That's just how we've chosen to do it. Totally. Well, I mean, and, and, and to, I, I, when I had the bars, we used to force our bartenders to change your middle name to, you know, the bar name, you know? And, and so and on Facebook and that would, back in the day, you could do that. And we said, make right. sure you go on there and you post. So you make an account and you whatever you, you were coming. We have an event tonight. Post this concert, whatever it was. So there is power to it. I, I just think we we as a, as as a, as as, a, as an age bracket as a society have have just put so much attention to it. We've kind of lost touch with. I mean, my my biggest feeling is the human element. Of it. Like going and yes. having a conversation with you in person or having a team meeting in person is so much more powerful and impactful than having one on a Zoom call. I, I've been doing Zooms yep. now for eighteen months. You know and and I say that with all candid candor because I'm invested in a technology platform, you know, that 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 literally does virtual inspections, right? Yeah. But that's a different element than than you know what we're doing as far as interaction with humans for for you know society purposes. Totally. So, yeah, the second you start replacing um, human interaction with technology, that's where you get huge issues, right? Uh, and a huge disconnect in terms of of interaction with people. So oh, I love that. Cool. Switching gears, I want to go back into uh, the equity part of things. I know you mentioned talking about that, um, you know, the growth, uh, acquiring companies, you know, first person to have uh, using debt equity to to get facilities. So walk us through what the difference is in terms of using when somebody hears debt equity, they they probably eyes gloss over like, what's that versus equity partners? Like, okay, people are going to come in and give me money to do what I want. So what's the difference between those two? And how have you leveraged that in your business for your growth? Yeah, so typically, you know, there's, there's a lot of obviously there's a lot of movement right now in the equity space and, and, and the HVAC space, particularly or home services in general. A lot, of, a lot of big firms are coming in, paying crazy high multiples for for platforms or companies that they want to tuck into platforms. Um, and how, how a deal like that typically works is, you know, the founder, the owner, the, whatever the organization that typically owns the business currently uh, would get some liquidity, uh, get to take some chips off the table, and then most times be forced to roll equity in, in, in a new deal. Um, but then you kind of become you know, beholden to what the equity, you know, partners who are investing in the company want you to do. Um, you know, and, and we, when I, when I, when we started growing the business, you know, we looked at a, at a different alternative, right? Like debt equity isn't a new thing. Like buildings use it all the time. I mean, you know, Donald Trump was famous for using debt equity, right? Like that's his thing. If you read the book, Art of the Deal, he told the banks, hey, if, we, if I fail, we all fail. So, you know, give me time to, to not fail uh, numerous times. Um, so, you know, what we did was we, we raised, we raised a debt facility to go out as an acquisition facility to go buy other companies. So we control our destiny. We control what we're going to buy, how we're going to buy it, you know, what we're going to pay for it. Um, what, what gives us a lot of freedom that most equity or platform companies wouldn't normally have. Now, right. you know, that's kind of what, what, what our vision was, and that's kind of what we're doing. And we, we, I think we're one of the first companies to actually pull that off. Um, so yes. we got a great capital partner. We love them. Uh, they're absolutely fantastic to work with. And. You know, we're super excited to, to you know deploy the capital and and you know acquire acquire companies. So if you're looking for uh, to sell your business, here's my selfish selfish uh, selfish plug. Uh, <laughs> hit me up on Anthony at AirProsUSA.com. <laughs> there it is. There so it because is. we there it is Anthony <laughs> at AirPros. USA.com. We will put that in the show notes in case it, it doesn't show up. But also on that note, if you do want to check out their company, AirProUSA.com is their website. Again, we'll put those on the bottom of the show notes there for you. Thanks, buddy. Appreciate that. <laughs> no worries. Normally, we say shamelessly plug, plug our guests, so you beat us to yeah. it. There That's you go. Good, man. Right? <laughs> I got. I, we, we, we got. We got a war chest to deploy, so we're looking for. We're looking for targets. Love so. it. Well, and where did this? Uh, 
desire to grow through acquisition come from uh, versus strictly trying to grow within your own market? Yeah, I mean, so obviously we, we, we naturally grow organically in our markets, right? That's kind of our core focus. And, and even though when you buy companies, you know, sometimes in the past, we've bought a lot of, lot of broken companies. And so we've yeah. become really good at fixing companies and you know, installing infrastructure, installing processes, installing controls. Uh, and obviously we get a lift for doing that, right? So we can create immediate shareholder value because we can install these processes pretty efficiently and effectively. And, and, and that's what our kind of our strong suit was. So up until this point, we went not raised, we raised debt equity. Um, you know, we, we've been buying broken companies. Um, and so, you know, when, when we were looking at the space and what was going on in the space, we wanted to control our own destiny because we, we find more value in helping, you know, shareholders fix their businesses and giving them some upside lift on that in the future for them. than coming in and trying to, you know, compete with every other, you know, Tom, Dick and Harry and be the highest bidder for a company that, you know, without the right team, uh, put in place, it isn't going to be successful. And that's kind of what we focus on doing in our, in our organization. Hmm. Shareholder value creation is big for us. Hmm. That makes a ton of sense. So, mm -hmm. um, so I mean, it's scary, I, listen, it, it, at the end of the day, you know, we, we didn't, you know, having this, this, this facility is, is, is fun, exciting, and, and it's something new. It's also a scary undertaking. We raised a bunch of debt and a bunch of capital that we're responsible for. Right. So, you know, yeah. our, our goal is to is to deliver to our shareholders, you know, great results. And we're in the process of doing that. So. Well, and I'm glad you mentioned the facility. because That's where I was going to go next was was this new acquisition yeah. of the facility. So tell us more about it. What uh, what's the plans for it and, and what's the purpose of it? Yeah. So for the debt facility or the new target we just acquired up in uh, up in the Sunbelt region, let's call it. <laughs> yeah, let's go with that. <laughs> Yeah. So um, for the for the for the facility we, for the for the debt facility, you know, our goal is obviously to go out and buy other companies and buy the buy the locations, buy the platform, or buy the organizations. Um, we recently, you know, just closed on a on a location uh, in in the Sun Belt, and we're super excited about that organization. Uh, and they have a really really strong brand presence, super strong operator. He's joining our executive team, and I, you know, that hopefully mm -hmm. that release and announcement comes out in the next couple of days. So maybe after the release, you can add a, a little snippet of who it was and what we did. All right, sweet. go back and add something into that. <laughs> <laughs> we can record some afterwards. We'll edit it in. You, you, you can stick it back in there. You, you got all the fancy, uh, fancy do, graphics going on here. Do it. Do an overlay on that. Do an overlay, right? So, so when somebody hears when somebody hears debt facility, um, and they're they're thinking, you know, uh, brush of layman's terms, you know, to to quote our guest uh, from the just an HVAC guy, um, yeah. you know, and and I kind of love that. So we're being very humble with that. So when somebody hears debt facility, what exactly does that mean? Break it down to layman's terms for for our listeners. So essentially, or, we uh, yeah, even even me too, for that matter. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. So, so we, we, we leveraged our EBITDA and revenue to raise capital, right? So essentially, instead of going out where, as I said earlier, where I would sell a chunk of the business to raise capital and then they would infuse capital and we would parry pursue, uh, parry pursue, you know, invest alongside of the, of, of the, of the capital partner. We went and said, Hey, Mr. Bank, I want to raise the debt facility to go out and buy the companies. Here's my plan. Here's what I'm going to do. Give me the capital to do it. And in that there's obviously terms and conditions and covenants and so on and so forth. But the good thing about that is on our, on our side of the spectrum as the operators, we get the ability to choose our targets a little more freely and we can still buy some of the smaller deals that may or may not make sense for a bigger platform that's certain even the targets and thresholds they have to buy. Right. So, you know, being staying on a CEO and, you know, building out our leadership team, you know, what, what, what a debt facility does for us is it gives us that, that freedom. Right. So, but it just like it's like buying a, putting a mortgage on a property, kind of the same thing, yeah. right? Like you got to pay it back. You're borrowing the money. Uh, it's debt, right? But you know we're using that to leverage and buy additional revenues and EBITDAs. Yep, you're just essentially paying the interest, right? That's your exactly. that's your versus it, versus it, it, having it, it, the, it, it, the, the shareholders simplest, involved. In the most simplest yeah. form, yes. Yep. So, uh, <laughs> perfect. Uh, hundred and something page document that goes along with that is probably a little more detailed, but in the most simple right? form, yes, <laughs> man, it's like reading, it's like reading the, it's like reading your mortgage document, man. That shit puts you to sleep. Holy, uh, 25 page. And that was only 25 pages and I read it. Um, you know, but it was, no, that was intense. So for sure. Um, cool. So bringing it back to your business then and, and some of the systems that you install, um, what are some of the things that you look to put into a new business right away? So you've acquired a business, they had some broken systems, uh, they were a little undervalued that way. So you came in, great purchase price, you acquired them. 
what are some of the first things that you're looking to install in that company to get it up and running and, and in the black as soon as possible? Yeah, I mean, every organization is different, right? So obviously we do a deep analysis on what what KPIs are missing, what, what you know, buckets are, they're short on, right? Um, you know, we're really good at managing our purchasing. Uh, we have some super cool technology we've developed that helps and facilitates with that. So, you know, that's, that's an easy fix. If purchasing is off and your, your, you know, your, your gross margins off because of that, you know, we can, we can, you know, come in and really fix that right away. Uh, our labor nice. controls are probably some of them the best, um, you know, but again, it's, it's every, every organization has their own, own levers and, and knobs. You got to push and pull right to, to, to take an impact, make an impact on. So it's not like a uniform plan where, Hey, I'm going to walk into business X and this is my entire plan. We do a full analysis and what can okay, listen, if your if your material costs are too high, your labor costs are too high, or you know your indirect is too high, or whatever the expenses line items may be, we make a plan for those and put our processes in place. Because you know we found we've made mistakes over the years. We come in and try to change a thousand things at one time, and it implodes your organization, right? That, that's that's not what you want. And I, I'm sure some of the best operators in the country, the Ken Goodrich's of the world, the Leland Smiths of the world, have done the same thing. They come in, I want to change everything, right? And they and and, and we, granted, you probably do. But if you do it too quickly and, and, and with too much force, it can really cause an impact in your organization. And so, you know, right. we we've, we've learned over time what 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 to do, what not to do. But it's all it's all you know proper planning. Um, it's all deep analysis, um, and then we we take one step at a time. Hmm. Our platform is, is 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 you know is pretty well integrated, right? So we have a centralized call center, we have a centralized HR function, a centralized accounting team. Um, so that, that that allows us to move a lot quicker than most. Because a lot of times platforms just kind of bolt on revenue and EBITDA. What we do is we kind of have the ability to to make a bigger impact quicker because we have these teams already established at a national level. Right. They essentially come in and take over the operations and bring in your SOPs uh, to it, and boom, off to the race as you go. It's it's quick, it's fast, and it's easy. Yeah, for sure. I mean, again, in in in, a, in the simplest form. Yes, <laughs> simplest form. I mean, obviously, we're talking on the super lot, on the super, on a superficial level, level, right? You know, hundred percent. When you get into like into the nuts and bolts and the back end of things, like yeah, that's a complex machine, right? Sure. I mean, like you you essentially doubled your revenue from fifty million to hundred million. I can only imagine the task of adding in a fifty million dollar per year business, um, and what's going in, involved in that in merging. You know, air pros with the uh, yet unnamed business. Um, <laughs> so, like, it's 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 an it's it's an intense and well-oiled machine. And, and, so, and listen, there's great operators out there, right? And we've learned a lot over the course of our yeah. acquisition, you know, path that, that we found great systems that we didn't have before that we adapted and, and, and changed. I mean, we've we've acquired companies where team leaders in those companies were, you know, amazing at marketing or amazing at the call center and, and have roles with us nationally in those in those fields or you know, amazing culture people. And we put them in a training position. Like, so, you know, we don't have the end all be all guidebook that, you know, every, every business is, is, is essentially a white paper because it's not right. These are living, breathing, you know, entities that, you know, we look at them as again, kind of cliche term, but kids, right. You're birthing a child, you're, you're creating a, an entity, right. So you got to be able to take every single organization and every single, you know, uh, nuance of organization at face value and then, and then make changes as, as you see them and as they're needed. No, hundred percent. Well, like you mentioned, you know, you've learned a lot in in terms of the acquisitions, and so one of the questions that naturally naturally comes to me is, okay, what has been? I guess I'm gonna, I'm going to use the word failure because you don't. If you take that failure and you you learn from that, now you can turn that into success. And obviously, this name of a show, HVAC Success Secrets Revealed. You now, if you were to take, um, and I'm going to have two parts to this question. One is what it was your your guys' biggest failure in acquiring a business that you guys have learned from that you'll never do again. That's an easy one. <laughs> okay. Uh, you want to write the second then, part down so I can answer the first part, or you want to just go through the second part? <laughs> uh, no. Uh, well, I'll just go through the second part because I'll probably forget because I am a couple whiskeys deep. So um, the For second sure. part of that is 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 from acquiring a company's point of view, and you know when you're acquiring a company, what would be I, there's a lot. I mean, there's a lot that goes in stake, right? You're you're taking over somebody's baby. Their their lifeblood. They've grown it. They've done that. They've doing that. Those sorts of things. So, what types of considerations uh, that you put in place, um, and and things that you have have learned in treading carefully with their baby? So, you know, we'll answer part two. Then we'll go to part one because part one is an easier, more to the point answer. Part two is a little more more detailed. You know, a lot of times when you buy a business, depending on the size and scale of the organization. You know, the owner or the operator 
you know, is is really the core kind of heartbeat of that, that company, right? So when you come in and you say, okay, Mr. Smith, you're no longer the CEO of this organization, we're gonna come in and take it over. That could really cause detrimental effect to the to the overall morale of the organization. And, and that's and that's not something that, that can be cured right away. It takes time to fix that, right? Because you understand out, the first pe- thing people think is, oh my God, there's gonna be so much change. It's corporate, it's corporate, it's corporate. And it's our job as operators on the AirPros platform to kind of quell that. Granted, some changes have to be made. We've gotten companies that are, you know, running totally in, in the red and, and upside down, losing a you know a million dollars every two or three months, right? And 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 some of those changes are more drastic. But you know, from, a, from an ownership perspective, I think the scariest part, to your point, is is what happens to the baby, what happens to the organization. So we're, we're super cautious on that. But you know, but we have found that sometimes that in buying businesses that are broken, that it's hard to get ownership sometimes to realize what it is they need to fix. And, and by explaining it to them, showing it to them, you know, they still don't want to take accountability to it. And so that's been a struggle in the past. And I think one of our failures is being not as, not as, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Not, not, not cautious, but uh, I guess more aware of that, right? Walking into an organization where, hey, you know, this guy did build his business from nothing. It's his baby. He birthed it. We're coming in saying, hey, great, great business, but you got to fix this, this, and this. And you can find defensive, right? Um, you know, so I think that if I had to answer that question, I think that'd be my, is the people, the people part of the business and, and how do you keep the morale? How do you keep the people? How do you keep the culture? Um, and, and we aren't always successful in doing that, right? Sometimes we can start down and rebuild. Um, we'd like to not, if we can help it, but it's, it's happened in the past. And I think the biggest failure I've ever done as an organization, um, was thinking I could take on big box and, hmm. and keeping my same margin profile and, uh, and everybody has this romantic illusion to, to coin your, your your phrase earlier, right? That big box is the way to go. I'm a strong believer. Otherwise, the margin's too tight and you're kind of holding, right? One day you wake up and the big box retailer can say, hey, dude, I'm canceling all your stores. You're sitting there with, you know, there's your number one lead source and, you know, dozens of lead generators and technicians and so on and so forth. And what do you do? How do you, how do you overcome that? How do you, how do you adapt to that conversation? So not all big box is bad. I would just be, I would caution you know, when you're looking at a, if you're looking at acquiring a business that is a big box retailer, you understand what you're getting into because it's a whole different business model than what we do at a retail HVAC shop. Hundred percent. Well, there's, uh, I mean, the people, right? I mean, you don't have a your organization doesn't exist unless you have the people in place um, yeah. and the people that care for it, and that's the biggest thing. And I'm glad that you mentioned that. And you know, I would love to definitely unpack that. However, cognizant of your time, I know that. Uh, we're coming up against the hour um, and you do have to to run fairly shortly on that. So as we start to to wrap this up, you know, we have one last question for you. Okay. I'm and scared. That is, Should I be scared? <laughs> uh, no, no, you shouldn't be scared. You shouldn't be scared. It's a, it's a, it's a pretty, it's a pretty easy question. Well, depending on who you ask, right? Yeah. Um, if I'm probably totally going to butcher it. I haven't asked it in a while. Evan's always been the one that's been, been ending the show. So, uh, I've run what, is, what is one question you wish people had asked you more, but they don't? That's what it is. What is one question people would, I wish people would ask me more, but they don't. A tough one. Um, I, I guess maybe not particular just to HVAC, just in business. People assume because we're, we're as big as we are now, like they'll ask, well, what did it take to get there? What did you do to actually achieve that level of success or achieving that level of success? I'm not saying we're the most successful company in the world by any means. I mean, you got right. super smarter operators than I am and who are a lot better. I mean, but, 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 you know, people say they, they see the nice things, they see the big house, they see the nice cars. Oh, great. You're just, you're just a successful guy, but Hey, what is your story? Like, tell me, like, I want to learn about how that, what, 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 what it took you to get to that level of success. I don't think mm-hmm. that, that question is asked enough, like from a story. It's, we all have our own unique stories and we all have our own unique, you know, ways of doing things and accomplishing our, our, our idea of success. And so I think from a question perspective, it's probably the question that I wish was asked more is, well, don't just assume, like ask how we got there kind of thing. Hmm. Probably, well, a, probably a little deeper, to... probably a little deeper answer than I think you were anticipating. I mean, I'm not answering <laughs> that question. It's probably. <laughs> no, I love it. And I mean, we've unpacked a lot of that within the show. You've, you've gone through a lot of your story. So if you could distill your story down to three key lessons that you had to pass on to someone, what do you think would be three of the most impactful lessons that you've learned along this journey so far? Don't be afraid to take the risk. 
That's number one. I mean, I'm gonna jump in with feet first and build the brand, not the business. Hmm. I love it. There you go. That's it. That's all it takes. Quit overcomplicating yeah. shit, take risks and build a brand. Mm -hmm. Exactly right. And jump in feet first and, and, and go after it. I mean, it's simple, right? I, listen, no. I, I'm, I'm, I'm living walking proof, right? I, I, I didn't know first thing about magazines, didn't know how to host an event, didn't know how to open and run a bar, didn't know how to maintain a bar, didn't know how to build or flip a house, didn't know how to do HVAC. I, I, I don't know how to be a technology developer, you know, and just you kind of go in and, and, and figure it out, man. I mean, listen, it's not that complicated. It's, it's, it's just be willing to learn, be, 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 be a sponge, be, and, you know, go in there with eyes open and ears open. Well, that right. brings us back full circle to that Richard Branson quote um, yep. that uh, that I said earlier, right? It's you just need to try it. Yeah, hundred percent. And, and away you go. So, um, well, I'll be the first to say, Anthony, thank you for taking the time uh, out of your day to sit and chat with two crazy Canadians. Uh, I can't wait to have you back on the show when you're doing two hundred fifty mil per year. Uh, that'll be a fun story to say. Hey, I took it from. Uh, you know, 100 million and added in another 150 million. So that'll be an exciting time. So, uh, I know it's going to be fun. So, thanks again. Thanks again for taking the time. Thanks for having me, guys. Appreciate it. No worries. Cheers. 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 Hey, thanks for watching another episode of HVAC Success Secrets Revealed. Before you go, two quick things. One, join our Facebook group, facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash HVAC Revealed. The other thing, if you took one tiny little bit of information out of this that was a golden nugget for you and your business, all we ask is for you to introduce this show to one person on your contacts list. That's it. That's all. One person. So they too can unleash the ultimate HVAC business. Until next time, cheers.